Now to the widening war in Afghanistan. More than 300 foreign soldiers have been killed since January, making 2009 the deadliest year since operations began eight years ago. The war is also taking an increasingly heavy toll on civilians. More than a thousand have died this year, many of them children. On Friday, six civilians were among 54 people killed in a NATO airstrike on two fuel tankers hijacked by the Taliban. NATO is currently investigating the incident, but it's reignited concern among ordinary Afghans about civilian casualties. For a frontline view, the ABC's South Asia correspondent Sally Sara spent 24 hours in the emergency room of one of the busiest combat hospitals in Afghanistan. But first a warning, this report contains material which some viewers may find distressing. It sits only metres away from one of the busiest runways in the world. The Roll 3 hospital in Kandahar looks nondescript from the outside, but inside it contains state-of-the-art medical facilities. The staff are bracing themselves for another busy night. Fourteen patients are scheduled to arrive, including US soldiers hit by a suicide bomb and children with shrapnel wounds from another blast. Lost his eyes, lost a leg, lost a hand. This one shot in the foot, this one shot in the head. Do you normally keep a track on your hand? Well, they don't issue us with pads, you know. It's the Canadian government has... <laughs> Bay 1 and 4 are free and ready to go. The officer in charge is Canadian Major Mark Dufay. He's been a trauma doctor for more than 30 years and has no desire to quit. I'm an old guy, I should be retired now, and I spend my time in Afghanistan doing this crazy work, so you have to do it for the love of your brothers in arms and to try and help the people here. The Roll 3 Hospital is staffed by more than 100 doctors, nurses and medics from around the world. Although it's a military hospital, almost half the patients here are civilians. 11-year-old Abdul has been severely injured by an improvised explosive device, or IED, a homemade bomb laid by the Taliban. Half of his uh, jaw was taken off. Uh, I didn't see his ear. It didn't seem to touch his brain, but you never know with IED blasts. They get frags uh, everywhere. One, two, three, slides. Doctors scan Abdul's head looking for shrapnel and bleeding. The explosion was so powerful it killed his brother instantly. But doctors are hoping that Abdul's jaw and not his brain has taken the force of the blast. If his brain is not affected, uh, his prospects are quite good. We have uh, maxillofacial surgery over here, so they're very good at reconstruction. The rest of his body seems to be all right. Although Abdul's face is still covered in the dirt from the explosion, his outlook is promising. It's some much-needed good news on a grim night. This is where the civilian cost of the war is counted. Mortuary workers have just taken out the body of a 10-year-old boy who was killed in a mine explosion this morning. He was so small that the body bag was folded in half like a suit pack. And that's how his life was carried out from this hospital. The dead boy's baby sister has stitches in her head. Her tiny feet are bandaged. The boy's brother lays bewildered, his arm amputated. Anxious relatives don't want their faces shown. They're frightened the Taliban will kill them if they speak out. They've lost so much but fear they could lose more. The suffering of the children leaves Major Dufay barely able to speak. It's a war. Women and children always pay. That's what's worse. That's all. Although the hospital looks after civilians, its priority is the military. The staff treat coalition and Afghan soldiers and Taliban insurgents. I try not to relate it too much because then it becomes too personal. So, you know, we just do our best to take care of them all. At the end of the day, if you've done your best, that's all we can do. US Navy critical care nurse Lieutenant Acursia Baldassano doesn't wear her real name on her uniform. She has a nickname instead. The medical staff protect their identities when they're treating Taliban patients because of fears of possible reprisal attacks against their families. For many of the doctors, caring for the enemy stirs up conflicting emotions. 
I just don't understand that cause. I mean, we're in two different worlds, and those people seem to be living a thousand years before what we are uh, we're doing right now. So they're on their own planet, their own world, and I just can't can't understand this. The medicos are not insulated from the dangers of war. Even the severely injured are checked in case they have been booby trapped by the Taliban. But for 11-year-old Abdul, there's a long journey ahead. He's been in surgery for several hours. He has 55 stitches on the side of his face. But his condition has improved and he appears to be out of danger. Uh, He should be waking up today and I think he had a CD scan this morning, which I assume was probably normal because he's doing better and he will be transferred to the ward today. So tonight we'll probably be eating on his own and uh, uh, going home tomorrow. The next day, Abdul is doing well and breathing on his own. The doctors say he's stable. But less than an hour after we filmed these pictures, he suffered a massive brain hemorrhage. Abdul died the following morning. Hospital staff found his father just in time so he could hold his son's hand. He was explaining to me he had four children, two daughters and two sons, and he said, can you please try everything to do to save my son? This is my last son. This is my only hope. So he was quite sad. Abdul's father lost his second son in two days. Abdul's empty bed will soon be filled by another patient fighting for life, and another family will be plunged into uncertainty. We cannot feel the pain that these people have. We can imagine, we can try to imagine it, but we can't feel it. Sally Sara reporting there from Kandahar.